take a moment. Listen to the stories by joining the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, and his guest on The Journey. When we all first heard about the coronavirus, many of us weren't sure how it could have a huge impact in our lives. Today, we're seeing several changes in our day-to-day goings and comings, most of which have us within our homes with our families. Today, we also have several Howard University medical professionals on the front line assisting our community. And so we have an opportunity to speak with one of our representatives on how we can continue to stay safe. Hello, I'm Dr. Wayne Frederick, and my guest today on The Journey is Dr. Siham Meju, Assistant Professor Howard University College of Medicine and Consultant Infectious Disease Division with Howard University Hospital Department of Medicine. First to begin with, we are using both terms, coronavirus and COVID-19. Explain for our listeners what the two terms mean. So that's a very good question. Um, so COVID-19, the abbreviation is CO, C-O, that's the corona, V-I, that's the virus. So coronavirus and the D is disease. So coronavirus disease 19 previously was called N19 um, or novel virus. Um, also the virus itself, so this is the disease. So if you have someone diagnosed with um, the illness, you, you're going to say we have a COVID-19 case, but the virus itself is called SARS-2 because we had SARS-1 in 2003. So SARS-2 means um, it's the virus of syn- the, the severe respiratory distress syndrome 2. Okay, understood. And that virus, the coronavirus, is a family of viruses. What types of infections do you get from them, and do they usually infect human beings? So um, the coronavirus is a family of viruses that um, infects people and gives you the common cold. So when you get the common cold, when you go to your doctor, they don't tell you you have coronavirus. They just tell you you have a common cold. But now we have these uh, three viruses, which is the SARS-1, the MERS-CoV-2, which was the Middle Eastern Respiratory Disease virus, and now the SARS-2, which gives us the COVID-19 infection or cases. So these are more severe uh, viruses, which are usually used to happen in animals. But then sometimes with this SARS-2, we have seen that these infections have gone to human beings and now we ended up having transmission between human beings. So this virus may have originated and been living in animals. True. And now has gone from animal to human. human Was this similar with SARS-1? Uh um, we are uh, thinking that SARS-1 and SARS-2 are very similar, and that's why the one that happened in 2003 is SARS-1, and this is SARS-2 that we're dealing with right now. So there is a lot of similarities between the two viruses. Right. Now, the common cold does not cause us this much concern. True. So since this is a virus of a family that causes the common cold, what makes this so much more of a concern in terms of the actual infection that you get? So this is a novel virus, and we are still learning a lot of things about this virus. There are still a lot of things we don't know about this virus. But for now, from the cases that happened in China and other countries where this disease was very severe, we know that this virus causes severe illness, basically eventually ends up in the lungs, and the lungs almost become very fibrous. That's why it's called a severe type. It gives you a severe type of illness. And that fibrosis in the lung is similar to scarring that you may get True. Um, on a cut on your hand or leg, etc. And obviously that then makes the lungs not as compliant. Right. This is new, but based on some of the information that's coming out of China, there have been reports suggesting that you could lose as much as 20% of your lung function as a result. Is that the case? Right. That's very true. So it's very severe, and that's why we're hearing all these uh, people who are getting severe illness ending up on mechanical ventilation, needing to be intubated and be on a ventilator. Now, 
How exactly is the virus spread? It's a respiratory virus, so the transmission is by droplet. So when people cough or sneeze, and then if they don't cover their cough or their sneeze, and those droplets end on you, uh, and or you know they end on your face. So that's why we're telling people don't touch your mouth, don't touch your nose, don't touch your eyes, wash your hands, cover your sneeze, cover your cough. But also that person who coughed or sneezed might have, these droplets might have ended up on a surface or they touched that surface. So that's how you also get the infection by touching that surface. And there are data coming out. Like I said, this is a very new virus. Like how long is the virus? Does it stay on surfaces? So it ranges between hours to up to three days. Like now there has been a new study in the New England Journal of Medicine that on plastic and stainless steel, it can last up to 72 hours. Now, once you've been exposed, so let's say you touch a surface, the virus was on there, you've now touched your eyes, nose, mouth. What would then be the course that the virus and the potential infection would then take and how would that manifest itself? So um, there could be two scenarios. You might acquire that infection and just be asymptomatic. You don't show the symptoms or you show no the symptoms. No symptoms at all. No symptoms at all. So, okay. uh, and, and like I said, we're still learning about these asymptomatic carriers, but the symptoms that show the most common ones are the fever, cough and shortness of breath. So basically as if someone is like running up the stairs, they just feel out of breath. But there also has been milder symptoms when people feel that they are fatigued or they have sore throat. Some also gastrointestinal symptoms like vomiting or nausea or diarrhea. But the common ones, the ones that we worry about when someone has been exposed and they have fever, cough or shortness of breath. Those symptoms sound very similar to someone who may have the flu, or as you and I were discussing, um, we both suffer from allergies, allergies. to pollen, etc. Uh, those things sound similar outside of the fever, and I think that that may be a very important distinction. You don't get a fever usually when you have allergies and you have more of nasal congestion versus what you're describing as a cough. Now, is that a productive cough in which you're bringing stuff up or is it a dry cough? So usually it's a dry cough. But again, just like I said, it's a new virus. So if someone has um, all these symptoms and they have risk factors and um, their x-ray is very suggestive of all these, you know, a viral pneumonia or something, then it could still be a case of COVID-19. All right. I want to switch gears a little bit. So you've now touched a surface, you've gotten an infection, you have those symptoms, you're at home listening to this, you're concerned. What should you do? Because one of the things that I want to be clear about is we want to make sure that we're not getting other people infected. Should you jump in your car and head to the emergency room? Should you call your primary care physician? What's your advice for how you even present to get something like this worked up? The best thing right now is to call your primary care doctor and just they will walk you through the symptoms. If you're having severe symptoms like very high fever, especially if you have a thermometer at home and you check your temperature, your temperature is more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you're having cough, you're just feeling uncomfortable, you're short of breath, you have pressure in your chest like chest pain, you should also call your primary care doctor or if you can get a hold of your primary care doctor, you should check yourself in into the emergency room. And this is very important because we don't want everyone to run and overwhelm the emergency rooms because it might be something simple that your physician can follow you, triage you over the phone, follow you over the next few days, and you might just get better because it could be for all we know just a common cold could be the influenza, you might be having some just minor symptoms. So we don't want everyone who have mild symptoms just to get in their car, run to the emergency room, I have COVID-19, I need to be tested. You're at home and you just develop those symptoms. You go, So you went to bed, you get up, you have chills, 
you check your temperature, you have a temperature, you have a fever. What should you do with respect to the family members in the household at that point as well? Anytime with any respiratory illness, it's very prudent that you kind of isolate yourself, stay away from your family members. If you're coughing, try. This is the time when you wear the mask because now I think there is misconception. Everyone is wearing a mask and walking around and they're healthy. They don't have any cough or anything. So if you are at home and you develop these respiratory symptoms, you have cough, wear your mask, isolate yourself from the rest of the family. If possible, if there is a you know, a, a, a different bathroom that you can use, you use that bathroom, try to stay in a different place in the house, of course, if possible, because not everyone has a big house or a place where they can isolate themselves. But, you know, just maintaining that distance of six feet away, that's very important. What, and, and that obviously would pertain to while you're waiting for your test as well, what you should do. Now, there have been some myths on social media about who can and can't get it. Um, is there any difference in terms of ethnicity, background, age group, in terms of who can acquire this infection? So um, the virus is not differentiating race, sex, color, or age. Everyone can get it. And there has be, had been reports about from China that even children don't get the, the, the illness, but there has been cases of children. There was a case of an eight years old in D.C. and But these children might be getting a milder illness than, for example, someone who is 60 years old or someone with underlying conditions like diabetes or cancer. So we don't want that myth to continue around and everyone should follow the recommendations and the guidance, which is social distancing. I appreciate it. As we wrap up, there are healthcare workers who are on the front lines. They're concerned. We have a lot of concerns about having personal protective equipment. Should every healthcare worker be wearing gloves and mask, or do you recommend that only if they are going to come into contact with someone that either has some s- symptoms that are consistent or a diagnosed infection, should they then be using? protective personal equipment? Yes. So um, this is a very good question because, um, you know, if the healthcare worker is dealing with a case of suspected or confirmed COVID-19, they should use their protective equipment, which is the gown, the mask, and the gloves. But if you're dealing with other patients who are not suspected or confirmed cases, you should use the standard precautions. Thank you very much. This was very informative. I have to close with the question I always close with, and that is why Howard? What brought you to Howard, and why do you think that this was the place for you to practice your craft? Um, I, I'm, I, I love teaching, and um, I just wanted... Uh, Howard is a great place. You are uh, serving a great community and diversity, and... Um, just being with the students and the residents is just my passion and teaching that. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us today. My guest today has been Dr. Siham Majoub. She's the assistant professor here at Howard University College of Medicine. And she's a consultant in our infectious disease division with the Howard University Hospital Department of Medicine. Thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure, Dr. Frederick.